Mark Carrier from Orawa Hospital. He's going to talk about the current treatment approaches in cancer-associated thrombosis. Mark? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a great pleasure today to be talking about current treatment approaches to cancer-associated thrombosis. Uh, Professor Elalami uh, eloquently talked about how we can stratify patients according to their underlying risk of having a venous thrombosis complication. Professor Maya talked to us about can we do something about it? Is there certain subgroups that we should consider thromboprophylaxis in them? But no matter what we do, sometimes these patients will have venous thrombosis. And in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to review a little bit with you what are the current clinical guidelines are saying and what's the background, what are the data supporting this. And then we'll talk about the acute treatment, but I also want to take a few minutes to discuss the extended duration, so what to do after the initial three to six months for extended duration or secondary prevention, preventing a second clot from happening. So if we look at the clinical practice guidelines right now, if you look at the ACCP today, what the recommendation would be for patients with cancer-associated thrombosis, they would recommend lomacroid heparin for at least three months and not over a vitamin K antagonist like warfarin or any of the directal anticoagulants. And we have very similar uh, recommendation if we look at international guidelines, for example. They would again recommend lomacroid heparin as the preferred option over vitamin K antagonist. They would recommend a minimum of three months to treat the acute treatment. And DOAX or direct oral anticoagulant might be considered in patients with stable cancer not receiving systemic chemotherapy or anti cancer therapy in cases where vitamin K antagonist is acceptable but not yet available. And now let's have a reflection of what's the data behind it and why are these recommendations making lomacroid heparin for a time being the, number, the first line therapy? Well, there's a number of randomized control trials that have compared patients with cancer associated thrombosis and randomized them to receiving a lomacroid heparin or vitamin K antagonist and followed them for a period of time, usually between three to six months. And how we assess efficacy in these trials, where well, we look at the risk of recurrent VTE or having a second clot despite anticoagulation, that will be on the left-hand side. So when we compare lomacroid heparin to vitamin K antagonists, patients with cancer-associated thrombosis that received lomacroid heparin had a relative risk reduction of about 44% uh, compared to vitamin K antagonists, so it seems to be more effective. When we look at safety, we like to grade safety based on major bleeding, and that would be on the right hand on the right-hand side, and patients receiving lomacroid heparin did not have an increased risk of having major bleeding complication. And you can see that the risk-benefit ratio is favorable, and therefore clinical practice guidelines like the ACCP and the international guidelines are recommending to use lomacroid heparin compared to vitamin K antagonists. Now, what about the DOAX? Well, there's a number of studies that looked at DOAX for the acute treatment of deep vein thrombosis and PEs in the general population. Within these different studies, a subgroup of patients actually had underlying cancer, and we've put all these data together. We can see on the slide here, on the top part, that DOAX were associated with non-significant lower risk of having recurrent VTE compared to vitamin K antagonists, and a lower risk of major bleeding, but that, again, not statistically significant compared to vitamin K antagonists. Again, giving you the rationale or the background why lomacroid heparin is the preferred option for the time being, and then when we compare it to the vitamin K antagonist, DOAX might be acceptable in certain settings. But of course, you know, over the past couple of months, a lot of things have happened. New data has been published and presented at different meetings. And we will hear about the SELECT-D pilot study and the Okusai VTE cancer trial by Dr. Tagalakis later. And this may change the landmark and what we do for clinical practice. So maybe we'll have to have a reflection about individualization of of treatment on a case-by-case -case basis, trying to see what's the risk-benefit ratio of recurrent VTE and major bleeding, accounting for patients' preferences as well. This will give us some insight, so it's going to be new recommendation or suggestion by different clinical practice guidelines when we have a look at the data in more detail. Now, the acute treatment is one thing, but often these patients, they need you know, they have cancer for a long time. So what to do after the initial three to six months of anticoagulation is unclear. And unfortunately, there's very little data to guide us clinicians in there. There's a little bit of guidance from the international guidelines, and they say after the initial three to six months, 
termination or continuation of anticoagulation, independent if you're using lomacoid heparin, vitamin K antagonist, or the DOAX, should be based on individual assessments on a case-by-case -case basis. And then you have to have a discussion, evaluation of what's the risk-benefit ratio, as we said, what's the risk of recurrence, what's the risk of bleeding, what's the tolerability of the treatment, what's the drug availability and finances as well, sometimes there's costs associated with it, what's the patient's preference, and we'll come back to that in the end, and obviously what's the cancer activity and what's the risk of cancer recurrence, for example, because that might lead to an increased risk of recurrent VTE as well. So who should probably continue anticoagulation. So we're talking about patients with cancer-associated deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism that has completed three to six months of anticoagulation. Well, if at the end of the, anti the acute anticoagulation period there's still active cancer, so advanced cancer or ongoing treatment, or advanced cancer in complete remission for whom the short-term risk of cancer recurrence is high, because that leads to an increased risk of recurrence, or the presence of other ongoing major risk factor, then these patients should probably continue some form of anticoagulation for extended duration for secondary prevention, prevent a second clot from happening. Now the next question is, well, Mark, what should I do? What type of agent should we use? Well, unfortunately, there's very little prospective data to help to guide clinicians. We do have a few studies with lomacoid heparin, the Delta-CAN study, for example, the TCAT study, and the ongoing STEPCAT uh, trial or study that will help us to give us some insight about what to do. So we'll have a look at the results in a minute, but these studies are probably saying that continuation of a lomacoid heparin at the current doses is probably reasonable for at least the first year. However, individualization of therapy including the DOAX, or in certain case, vitamin K antagonist, might also be reasonable in certain settings. But let's have a look at the data before we make up our mind. So there's two studies. There's single-arm studies. Well, the first one is the Delta-CAN, using Delta-Parin at a dose of 200 units per kilogram per day and dose reduction after a month, and then followed patients for a total duration of 12 months. The initial aim of the study was to look at major bleeding to ensure safety of lomacoid heparin long-term or extended duration. So if you look on the left-hand side, you have major bleeding outcomes, and it's divided from month 7 to 12 to two, uh, compared to 2 to 6. Obviously, we exclude the first month because when patients are exposed to anticoagulation, they're very high risk of recurrence or major bleeding because we're exposing them to blood dinners. But you can see that when you compare month 7 to 12 versus 2 to 6, there's really no difference in the monthly rate of having major bleeding complication. And this is probably indirect evidence saying that it's probably safe to continue the same dose. On the right-hand side, we have risk of recurrent VTE, and again, it's stratified in the same way. So we exclude the first month because the risk of recurrence is highest, and then we looked at months 7 to 12 versus 2 to 6, and you can see that despite continuing anticoagulation, the risk of recurrent VTE remains relatively high in months 7 to 12 compared to 2 to 6, and it's about the same thing, meaning that you know, patients are probably benefiting from anticoagulation otherwise uh, the risk of recurrence might have been higher, but again, there's no control group, so again, a little bit of indirect evidence, but overall, the Delta-CAN study is saying that's probably reasonable to continue anticoagulation beyond the initial three to six months at the same dose for a total duration of 12 months. Now, the TCAT study is very similar, single arm, and using tenzaparin at a dose of 175 units per kilogram per day for the entire study duration, and looking again at major bleeding on the right-hand side, and risk of recurrent VTE on the left. And then for this particular study, I'll focus specifically on major bleeding, again, because we want to ensure safety in the intervention of the anticoagulant. Uh, the anticoagulant. And you can see from month 7 to 12 is very similar to month 2 to 6. Again, indirect evidence saying that's the right thing to do. Now, could we scale back the dose a little bit? Could the patient needs to be on therapeutic dose or intermediate dose of lomacoid heparin? Well, that's still an important knowledge gap, and Dr. Tagalakis is doing a prospective study of patients that have completed three to six months of anticoagulation, and then they have a dose reduction to a prophylactic dose of lomacoid heparin, in this particular case using an oxaparin 40 milligram sub-Q once a day and following patient over time. And this will really inform clinician, can we scale back on the dose a little bit and hopefully decrease the risk of bleeding associated with anticoagulation regimen as well.
Now, we talked about who needs to continue anticoagulation. The next question is who can actually stop anticoagulation? Well, usually clinicians would feel comfortable stopping anticoagulation if the underlying cancer has been treated with a curative intent and there's no additional ongoing risk factor that would increase the risk of thrombosis. So the patient is felt at low risk. So when you put the two in the same balance again, you see that the risk of recurrent VT is relatively small and the risk of bleeding is probably a little higher and therefore you probably want to stop anticoagulation at this point in time. Now, these two examples are pretty easy, but in most cases, unfortunately, often we say, well, you may or may not stop anticoagulation, and who that is, it's probably the majority of your patient, patients with complete remission with a low to moderate risk of recurrent cancer of VTE, and that might be at higher risk of recurrence, so that in that case, you have to sit down with the patient, talk about patient's preference, talk about what's the risk and well, how they feel the risk is, and then go on um, uh, you know, every, with frequent follow-up every three to six months to ensure nothing has changed. But at the end of the discussion, you may be able to stop anticoagulation. You may want to continue on with anticoagulation if you use low microwave heparin to the same dose, or you may want to switch them to something different. It might be a direct oral anticoagulant or vitamin K antagonist. So these are a little bit different cases that you need really to sit down with the patient and do the case-by-case -case evaluation with them. Now, we talked a little bit about person, patient's perspective, and that's very important because, unfortunately, can, pay, cancer patients, when they see us in clinic, they don't see themselves as a blood clot type of patient. They see themselves as a cancer patient first. So the first thing on their mind, although the distress of having a PE and they have symptoms and they're scared, their, the number one thing on their mind is they want to have an anticoagulation regimen that will not interfere with anti-cancer treatment, right? They don't want to have any delays in chemotherapy. They don't want that, uh, that surgery being postponed. That's the first thing on their mind. And as clinician, that's the first thing we should address. The second thing is reviewing efficacy and safety with them. They want to make sure that the anticoagulation regimen they're using is effective, but also safe, not associated with increased breeding. So that's, as a clinician, our job to decide what's the risk, the nice risk-benefit ratio. And thirdly comes root of administration. So if the first two are, are fulfilled, then of course they prefer a tablet than lomacroid heparin, but lomacroid heparin is deemed to be very acceptable in the setting of cancer depending on the different clinical situations. Now, you might be disappointed with the data I've shown you for extended duration thromboprophylaxis, and you're, mon you're wondering, is there going to be better data in the near future? And the answer to that is probably no, unfortunately. There's two groups that tried to do randomized control trial in that area. The first group was from the UK, so the ALICAT study, mixed method, trying to see if it was feasible to do a randomized control trial in that setting, and the Longheva group uh, from the Netherlands tried to randomize patients after six months of anticoagulation to oral anticoagulation versus low microwave heparin, and none of these groups were able to do their randomized control trial. The Long HIVA had to stop early because patients and doctors had fixed views about anticoagulation after six months. Some of them prefer to be on a parenteral agent because it's going well. Some would prefer to be on, on tablets. They're not ready or they don't want to be randomized. So I'm, I think, unfortunately, for the time being, We'll be stuck with the data that we've discussed, so that and hence it's important to really sit down with the patient and go through the different steps with patient's preference to make sure we make the right decision when we meet the patient and follow up. Thank you. Thanks very, uh, very much, Mark, for this excellent review. I want to ask you one very simple uh, clinical question. How do you assess the risk of BT in, in your cancer patients that receive anticoagulation? Simple question, but difficult answer. There's, there's not a right way to stratify patients according to the risk of recurrent VTE. So what we're talking about, what if your patient had cancer-associated thrombosis is started on anticoagulation? How can you stratify the risk of having a second clot despite anticoagulation? There's a few uh, stratification models or risk prediction models that have been published. One is the modified Ottawa score, looking at tumor types and stage, but unfortunately that was not validated in other prospective studies when they tried to do external validation in the CAT randomized, the CAT randomized trial, for example, or the Rieti registry. So at the end of the day, we don't have tools just yet to help clinicians stratify who's at really high risk and who's at low risk, but you can intuitively probably figure it out. So there's certain tumor types 
that, for example, pancreatic cancer, gliomas, certain types of melanomas that would be at very high risk lymphomas would be high risk of recurrence, and therefore you probably want to be careful when you initiate anticoagulation, follow them closely. A stage would be an important risk factor. For example, they have metastatic disease, they're more likely. Age, again, and then the other risk factors that we see in non-cancer patients are, I'm sure, are contributing as well. So this is what I use in my clinical practice for the time being to try to stratify the risk. Thank you very much. Thank you.